much. Um, good afternoon to everyone. It's uh, 10.30 in, in Israel at the moment. Um, what I'll be doing is um, trying to end in 40 minutes, yeah, but that's always been a problem. So if you find me talking very rapidly at the end, you'll know that I've been looking at my watch. The, um, we talk about the Israeli army, the Israel Defense Forces. I'll be dealing with the human aspects, but uh, you know, I think our minds, uh, as you're listening to me uh, today, uh, very much we're thinking about the importance of a country having defense forces uh, which will, are strong enough to defend themselves. And I'm sure like uh, everyone uh, on the, this uh, program at the moment, uh, we realize that the Ukrainian army, a young country, uh, I've been there uh, five or six times, I know it very well. And at the moment I'm working on a few programs on, on the uh, Ukraine uh, Jewish community, uh, I think we realize that armies are, are very important. And I'm going to try and speak about the human aspects. It, it's going to be an analytical and maybe a critical approach. Uh, but I, I must say, having been deeply involved with the Israeli army in different realms, um, it, it's important, it's good for me to know that we have a strong army to defend us in case of need. I just want to uh, start off with, uh, I want this to be a, a personal presentation, not only an academic one, um, because I, I must tell you that as someone coming from another country, I, I arrived uh, after having completed my undergraduate degree in what today is Zimbabwe. Um, and, you know, when you come to a new country one and one wants to really become a, a part of it, uh, one has to work out what are the mechanisms of belonging. And in the, the case of Israel, one of the best ways of really being part of the society on not only on, on in terms of serving your country, but in terms of understanding this new environment is through the Israeli army. And I uh, initially started off being in a long distance uh, radio telephone communications unit, very, very complex, very technical, which is not my strong point. And after a number of years in that unit in the reserves, I managed to move into what came to me maybe one of the most exciting learning experiences that anyone can have, and that is the Israeli Army uh, Education Unit. Um, there were a number of uh, parts. I just I'm going to give you just one or two cases of some of the things I learned when I was uh, touching the people, and I think. This for me was the important thing. I, I gave many hundreds of lectures to various groups. Um, they would range from pilots uh, to top army generals on a few occasions, down to the regular soldiers who I'd be meeting somewhere at an army base or somewhere in the middle of nowhere. The, the particular subunit that I was involved in with education was a, a number of us were asked to help Israeli officers and soldiers to how they should deal with complex issues. By the way, it's not in terms of military understanding, but rather in terms of human understanding. For example, there was a, a famous case with um, terrorists uh, moving over from Jordan, hiding in a cave near the Dead Sea. Uh, the terrorists put a uh, uh, family, women and children at the front of the cave. The question is, how should the Israeli soldiers behave when you know that a very dangerous group are behind the women and the children? Those sort of issues are come up again and again. Uh, what was particularly interesting for me was a uh, experience of a three day army exercise, which we were frightened that we would be going into war with Syria. And uh, the army wanted to find out, is it better for soldiers to know who the enemy is? And uh, because I'm very, I'm a social historian and, and uh, I've been deeply involved in Middle Eastern issues, um, they wanted me to make the Syrians alive, human beings. And so there was a, a long and very complex uh, uh, exercise. My lecture was the last of the three day activities. And they, they had a questionnaire at the end. And sometime later, I got a message from them and they said, you, we asked a question, if you're going into war against Syria, does it help you 
to understand that the Syrian is a human being. The Syrian soldier is a human being. And the overwhelming majority of soldiers said yes. And I thought that was very, very encouraging. By the way, it was one of the top uh, armored units of the Israeli army. Then on the other hand, just to give a totally different uh, perspective, uh, the Israeli army produced a movie called, in English called Ricochet, in Hebrew, Don, a very complex movie about the brutality of war and military occupation. And just to be emphasizing, this was made by the army to be showed to soldiers. There were some people in the army who said, this is anti-army. You're going to make the soldiers want to leave the army. But the education unit at the SAI at that time said, no, we want soldiers to deal with what might happen when we find ourselves in the Lebanon war as we did. And here you see the picture. This is of the Hebrew version. This is part of the movie itself. Amazing issue where this uh, one soldier uh, finds a dog uh, in, uh, in Lebanon. It, it's unbelievably uh, sensitive. And here we have what I was also involved in many, many occasions, uh, lecturing at Yad Vashem, by the way, which is a delicate issue. Um, uh, what is the value of power when often you're speaking in Yad Vashem about the Jew as powerless and the Nazi as having power? All these issues were some of the things that I found myself dealing with. And because of it, I, I feel comfortable in giving the session that I am uh, today. So what actually what started off for the 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 army starts off and is deeply influenced by the pre-state militias. The, uh, the the years after the creation of the state, we were going back again and again trying to work out how did the Jewish people, a people who by and large have not been involved in military activity, you look through history, uh, there are some cases in the Tanakh, but uh, by and large Jews have not been involved in armies of other countries. And uh, what, how were we going to form a society which doesn't have a military background in it? And that's why understanding the pre-state militias was extremely important. And as you can see, there were basically four organizations, very different from each other, very political. And this brought about deep tensions. There was a moment when one almost could imagine that a civil war was going to come about with the tensions between these uh, pre-state uh, underground militias. Fortunately, it never got uh, to that exact situation. There were early ones that from 1907. They become much more formal in 1920. We see the Haganah people over here. A little later, we have the Irgun, a right-wing group, Etzel in Hebrew, uh, supported, led by Menachem Begin. Then we have the Lehi, which was more radically right, uh, led by Abraham Stern. Here we see a young philo philosophy student who um, had a, a very uh, militaristic approach to what would happen. And the last stage of the development of the pre-state militias is the famous pa Palmach. Here we see uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Yigal Alon, two people who became central leaders uh, of the country. So this was really what built the society. But the big challenge came, obviously, when we had our own state. And uh, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, um, who himself was not a military man, but learned a great deal about uh, armed forces, decided that there was no other way that we could survive without having a conscript, a conscript army, which means uh, you have to join the army except in certain cases, and I'll deal with the exceptions uh, a little bit earlier. The early army was extremely successful between November 1947 and January 1949. The IDF, uh, excuse me, succeeded in the conflict against uh, five Arab countries around us. By the way, there's an ongoing discussion on how we did it, and the one of the answers is that we already had pre-state training that I mentioned a moment ago, so when we formed the actual army uh, with all its internal tensions, we had training. We were a trained army, um, something, by the way, which the, the Ukrainian army at the moment uh, seems to have uh, lacking, not having had 
the same kind of experience. The army immediately became one of the most important nation building frameworks. And uh, just to give us an idea, uh, within about uh, a year or so, year and a half, the uh, size of Israeli society almost doubled, doubled from 1948 to 1951. Tremendous amount of immigrants were coming in. And the attempt to bring those immigrants who came from a vast number of different countries, in fact, Israel has immigrants from 105 different uh, arenas in the world, the nation building process had to be part of the army's job. And in fact, many people going into the Israeli army, immigrants like myself, for example, although I'd been in Israel for a number of years before I was called up, but for many people, the only time that they're gonna actually feel the nation as, a, as a, a defined concept would actually be through the army experience. And therefore the army is not only an army for fighting, it's also an army to give people a sense of the society that they belong to. In 1948, we already begin to deal with some of the tragedies. And just to take one case study, in the famous Battle of Latrun, here we see what remains of uh, an earlier um, Jordanian building, um, uh, which was at Latrun. The, uh, the, a very significant of the soldiers who lost their lives were Holocaust survivors. It's a, it's a painful story. Some of them had been in Israel no longer than two weeks. They were given a very, very quick training period of a few days. Um, many of them, the overwhelming majority of them, had a minimal understanding of Hebrew. And just to give you one component of the famous Batun battle, when the order was given to retreat, it had to be translated into seven different languages during a war or conflict situation. And you can therefore understand how very, very painful that particular event was. But what is the army all about? Let's look at it from the human perspective. And let's first ask the issue and the, the dilemma of what is army service for the majority of citizens? And a little later, I'll go into those who don't serve in the army. There's always been a fairly large gap between men and women. Uh, men's uh, conscription is essentially two and a half to three years. And for women, it's one and a half to two years. Now, many of the Israeli soldiers, and just to speak our own family, um, our four children, three sons and a daughter, all served more than the required period, two of whom were uh, officers, one went into a special unit, and our daughter also had to do an extra six months because of what she was doing in the army. The challenge of the Israeli army is unbelievable, and this is how do you decide who is going to go where? Remember, you're conscripting these people. It's not like the American army or many other armies where people decide to go in. Here are you taking people who may not want to be in. So immediately the army is dealing with a certain part of the population who don't want to be there. Others are very, very much want to be there. So we have this division between the different people. And the early stage is um, the testing of how the army can best use this mass group of people, tremendous part of society, 50% of all Israelis are serving in the army. How does one decide what to do with them and where to send them? So we have two criteria. One is the physical criteria to see exactly if, you can, if it's good for someone to go into a realm which is basically physical or not. By the way, the Israeli army, the concept of the best and most important soldiers are those who are in the front line is constantly being tested at the moment because now many of the brightest and the best people are going into computer intelligence, um, cyber kind of uh, realms. So there's kind of a change of the way we used to understand what it really is to be in what is called an elite unit. Elite unit terminology has gone through change. What's been, uh, uh, and I was actually very interested in the question of what I translate the Kaaba, the Hebrew word Kaaba, uh, here as I call it uh, quality motivation. 
If we take a soldier, let's say for two or three years, a woman or a man, how do we decide which unit we're gonna try and send them to? Now you fill out a form at a certain stage and you're given three choices, but the army doesn't want to rely on someone's personal choice because the army realizes that what you're gonna to have to do is if you're gonna have a soldier for three years, which is the nature of the conscript army, un unlike the permanent army uh, uh, structure, you want them to be in a suitable unit as quickly as you can possibly get to it. And so therefore there's this ongoing testing period of how to get people in. Initially, by the way, there were some problems because uh, for many, many years, there was a feeling that if your mother or your father had, for example, been in the Palmach, you were going to be a suitable soldier. Most people came, many of the soldiers, uh, 50, over 50% 50 of the soldiers came after the period of the Palmach. So there was this ongoing change of how you decide who goes where. Um, some of it is, is physical and some of it is what I call quality motivation, which is a whole range of difficult questions. The tremendous amount of what the Israeli army of the reserves, Miluim, which can go up to 45 years of age. If you're in a uh, fighting unit, you can get out earlier. If you're in a, a based kind of non-violent unit, um, sometimes you can even be there over the age of 45. The, um, there's no doubt about it, that the soldier going into the Israeli army is deeply influenced by family history and social environment. Some people come from countries where serving in the army is against what they believe in, not only for political or ideological reasons, but because if you come from Russian army, for example, the army was the enemy. The army was often seen as very much a, a realm of anti-Semitism. So there are all these kinds of things which are coming in in, a, in, in the conscript army, which you don't have the exact same challenges if you've got a, a regular army like you do in the United States. The family is, is very much involved. One of our children was ill. Um, I'll never forget a, a midnight call to the commanding officer of the base. And I spoke to him and I said, our son is sick. We're not happy with the medical attention that he's getting. The next day I got a call from the same senior officer said, you, you're probably right. Your son seems to be in a bad way medically. Are you prepared to come and pick him up from the base and take him to your own doctor if that's what you want? So it's an interesting, different kind of army. Uh, I described all the army always, always as a non-hierarchical army. That means someone is an officer and another person is a regular soldier. It really doesn't matter. That is not what it's all about. So being non-hierarchical, sorry, um, you, um, you have this up and down uh, influence. It's not the structured uh, format that you find in various other armies. One of the new uh, phenomena which we find is in the early days, the kibbutz members were the creme de la creme, were the elite. Um, in the last decade or so, the high, a very high percentage of officers, various level of officers, or national religious uh, uh, officers, uh, Dati uh, Lumi or modern Orthodox, they've in many senses become the um, most um, army oriented group. And we can see in this picture here, just looking at the number of uh, kipot, this is the kippah of the modern Orthodox. That really is, a, is an interesting uh, indication of where the army is going in terms of the officer corps. Now, let's try and um, work out what are the benefits. Why does someone who goes in willingly, by the way, not everyone wants to go in, but uh, the majority go, it's known to be part of, a, uh, part of the pro progress, part of being a part of the Israeli society. If you don't go to the army, it doesn't mean you're excluded, but you don't have that exact same feeling. So what, are, what does army do for you? What does the Israeli army do for you? So trying to uh, look at the positive as aspects, and this is the, uh, what I put here, is based on a tremendous amount of literature. We have mass amount of material on these topics that I'm talking about, and I've seen this uh, for myself as well. We can say that the army um, is much more than army. 
if we speak about personal growth, there's no doubt about it that everyone, many of you who've met Israelis know that having been through the army, someone, a 21 year old Israeli is very, very different from a 21 year old American student. The army teaches you by definition, unbelievable coping mechanisms. You grow up quickly. You uh, can't turn immediately to your parents or your other friends. You have to deal with what you're dealing with immediately. This also at the same time, because of the tensions of army service, one finds that friends and partners for life develop. Masses of research will show that good friends of many people didn't come through high school or university, but rather, rather through army service. The army brings about a tremendous interaction. I'm sure many people can live in their own countries with only reaching a relatively small amount of, their, of the other groups, of the groups not immediately connected to them. Here in the Israeli army, we can see in this picture here, if we went through the various pictures and looked at these people and uh, one did a, a general analysis, one could say they come from all parts of the world and you, you're living in the same barracks, in the same room with people who in general life, that would not actually uh, happen. For many people, the army service is the, uh, a part of the first stage of a, of a career. The army tries to get people out quite, uh, quite young and you know, and their people in their forties will then go on to second career. And in many, many cases, uh, the second career will be something which the army, a, a skill which the army has given them. And or in many cases, uh, bosses, people looking for staff would hear that someone's been in the army and done a particular job there. And that would be one of the ways that you would actually be accepted within the uh, workforce. For some people, uh, not all, the army is seen as the Ivy League. Uh, this is the Harvard and Yale of, uh, of Israeli society. Um, it, it, it's kind of, we, the Israeli universities, I it was taught both at the Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University, I, I don't think have the aura that you have of Ivy League uh, places in the United States. Um, and therefore the army becomes in that sense, very important for the people. If you don't serve in the army, many people who decide for one reason or the other don't want to, there is an alternative route, a route which is called national service, which is designed, it used to be designed almost totally for a religious women who didn't want or weren't allowed by their parents or rabbis to go into the actual army. So this was a separate uh, route, which is very important. Sometimes in the old days, it was going down to development towns or working in hospitals, teaching at various schools, very, very important component. It's kind of side by side, she will me in English, side by side uh, with the with army service, uh, shorter normally, one or two years and no more. But for those people who do it, it's very important for all the reasons that people in the army find. What are the negative components? And I mention this because I think sometimes there's glorification. Uh, I, I do meet people every now and again who kind of look at this army as this wonderful, wonderful place. We have to realize that there's another side as well and a very tough side in many cases. For an 18 year old person who's uh, lived uh, at a home and maybe had their own bedroom and uh, uh, cooked meals whenever they came back from school or wherever it is, um, suddenly jumping from the nuclear family to what I call a, face of, a faceless collective unbearable reality for some. The jump is so sharp. I mean, I, I was somewhat older when I went into the reserves, when I went to the army and then the reserve. But I imagine for uh, 18 year olds, it must be extremely difficult. The army is an army, it has a rigid framework, although I think the Israeli army has levels of flexibility that I don't know is true with all armies. I say that by the way, because I've had contact with American colonels who would come to learn about the Israeli army and I'd meet them on uh, some of their courses. 
And uh, they were very much aware. I'd, I'd meet some of them at the beginning of their time here and then do a summary of them at the end. And they, they were very much aware of the what they saw as the softness of Israel, of the Israeli army, the flexibility, the non-hierarchical section of it, which seemed to be very important. But at the same time, however so-called soft it is, which it isn't really, but that was their terminology, you certainly lose your personal freedom. Excessive physical demand. You, you have a high physical rating, the highest is 97, for example, and suddenly you find that you just, things are demanded of you, which you just can't cope with. We have a um, post-traumatic uh, stress issue. We have uh, cases of loneliness and certainly suicides. The suicide rate um, is not high. I mean, in the big picture, we're talking about a massive bureaucracy. The suicide rate, uh, rate isn't high, but there's always the feeling when you're seeing a soldier who's depressed, and here I'm giving a picture of someone who looks depressed, and you know we have these pictures quite often of someone's head really down for one reason or the other. The fact that there are suits in the army has to be taken very uh, seriously. Um, for many people, they feel that its long-term service was not useful for their civilian li life. That means they were doing something which they, what they saw as their skills were not going to be used in civilian life. My argument was, although it might be very different, you might be in a, a foot uh, battalion or something like that, um, there, there, there are other skills which are learned, but many people obviously uh, uh, didn't feel that. We have a not small number, I, I'm not always sure, I've seen a, a, you know, a broad range of statistics, but um, there is certainly the situation where people at a certain stage are experiencing trauma, they then leave, they can, you can get out of the army if you're showing uh, a, a, a problems here, I've mentioned mental health uh, issues, and then there's a feeling that those people who didn't complete all their army service that they, they feel they failed. So we're dealing with very human issues of a broad section of uh, population, wasting time treading water is, is true. And one of the questions that generally we're asking about ourselves is that the army status, which used to be so very important, has, uh, has gone through uh, a change. Um, I think uh, Shifty, Shifty Crane, maybe you can put your question in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll deal with it a little later. So let's look at the marginal groups. Uh, as I said, 50% of Israelis uh, do not serve in the army. So what are they doing and who are they? A very broad uh, range. Um, uh, f firstly, sorry, I'm dealing with the positive side of the marginal groups and I'll deal with the negative side. So the positive side, you take better Israel Ethiopians who haven't been through Israeli schools. And the army for them is extremely important. By the way, unfortunately, proportionate to the number of Ethiopians in the Israeli army, their suicide rate is the highest. So this is, I remember very much having to try and grapple with this issue when I was in the reserves. Um, lone soldiers. Uh, lone soldiers are people who come here without families. The Israeli army has a whole framework of helping lone soldiers. For example, in the early days, kibbutzim would be bringing the lone soldiers into the kibbutz. And nowadays you have families and institutions who adopt the lone soldier. The uh, Raful Lagruth uh, uh, developed many, many years ago. These are school dropouts, um, people who would otherwise not have a chance to go anywhere. They've been brought into the army sometimes with difficulty, by the way, because they don't always adapt so easy to uh, army service, but this is their second chance. There's this, about 5,000 ultra-Orthodox who are in the army. Uh, many of them, but, uh, we call them Khardalniks. They're somewhere between ultra-Orthodox and modern Orthodox. It's kind of a relatively new development, small numbers, basically. And um, for them getting into the army, they're almost feeling marginalized because they're not fully ultra-Orthodox. Some of them, by the way, are in themselves school dropouts. Uh, and the army, once again, uh, gives them a framework. They, 
excuse me, <coughs> they no longer feel alone. We have Bedouin uh, trackers from poverty background. The Bedouin lived tough lives in many of them in the south of the country. They once, they become permanent army people and therefore have jobs. And the most amazing event that I have ever seen was uh, Down syndrome soldiers. Just one or two sentences on this very quickly. Um, I, we spent a day, a number of us in the education unit, spent a day, we were asked the question, should the army uh, invest the significant amount of money that they do in Down syndrome uh, uh, people? Um, the Down syndrome people have more or less a one-to-one -one situation, which for each of them, there's a, a soldier who works with that uh, male or female. The, uh, we got the figures. It worked out to be unbelievably expensive. But when we were asked at the end of the day, and we were a group of people from very different backgrounds, we were asked at the end of the day, the army said to us, you know, do we think that uh, the Israeli army with all its other challenges should actually take in this particular population. And I think there were five or six of us. We all said without doubt, yes, this is very, very important. By the way, for many autistic people, it's found that they are excellent in particular realms. For example, watching screens, they have a, an ability to watch and observe certain phenomenon on a screen that for uh, the other uh, soldiers, they can't do it. So. You know, the Israeli army tries, when it's doing a good job, to really bring in people, even though from a straight money position, it might not be uh, such a good idea. The um, who doesn't serve? Almost, almost as, a, as a, a general comment, one can say the Haredim don't serve. It's true, Haredi men and uh, Haredi women. There is this Netzach Yehuda group, who are made up of Hardal, that group that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, but they are only a very small number of the wider ultra-Orthodox society. Modern Orthodox women, by and large, do not serve in the army. However, the number is increasing in very significant numbers, and while many of them do national service, a significant number of the modern Orthodox women have had to fight against army regulations and fight against their high schools in many cases, or certainly the rabbis, and they've wanted to join the army. But by and large, this is almost um, uh, un not to be expected. Israeli Arab citizens do not have to serve in the army, are not expected to serve in the army. There are certain groups which are the accept, accepted. Druze, the people who live in, the, say, around the Haifa area, uh, are um, the men are required, were required from the 1950s to serve in the army. The women were uh, not required and not expected to serve in the army in 2020. For the first time, we had uh, Druze people from the Golan Heights who actually volunteered. We have a very small number of conscientious objectives. It really is a tiny figure. And therefore, we obviously, in people who don't serve, are by and large people with physical and mental challenges. Here we find someone who's in a wheelchair. Here we found someone who you can see uh, has a handicap. But the army, as I mentioned, brings these people in. By and large, the phenomenon of the last decade or so is decreasing number of recruits. The discussion of the country 2021 brought out some uh, unexpected comments. It was, uh, firstly, we know that only 50% of potential recruits actually uh, enlist. The army wants the figure to get up to 70%. But we have uh, this very large number of people who don't serve in the army. Um, and this is really causing tension because those 50% who do serve feel that they're carrying the burden of the country. Um, the, uh, the, the last big poll of, on this uh, point, uh, 2021, showed that about half of the Israeli population favor a volunteer professional army 
which they believe would be more, more efficient. And this is really also part of the change going through Israeli society, where we are increasingly an individualistic capitalist uh, country. By the way, this is a picture which I like because this is a birthright group. And in the birthright programs, one of the jobs which the army pe uh, people love is to spend a week or so, or sometimes it's, it's a bit less, with the birthright group. And here you can see these two soldiers are, are obviously very, very excited. <laughs> and by the way, we have a number of cases where uh, there's been a marriage between a birthright person and one of the soldiers based on a few days relationship, which that says something about the value of birthright. The, um, the sensitivity and the issues are tremendous. Israel serves, the Israeli soldiers serve both within the uh, old green line and uh, as well as in the territories. A very political issue, uh, depending where one is uh, in terms of one's uh, viewpoint. The, uh, there's an organization called Breaking the Silence, Shovrim um, Bishtika, um, people who uh, the uh, Breaking the Silence, that's the name of the organization. They are people who served in the army. For example, here we have a case study, and these are Palestinians who've uh, being held uh, blindfolded and with handcuffs. And um, the breaking the silence are Israeli veterans talk about serving in the occupied territory. So these are people who've uh, had to deal with the Palestinian population and are feeling, have felt very uncomfortable about it. And we're very upset by what they saw. So we have that uh, voice out there in the country, um, uh, as well as those who totally favor the army service. And here we see a picture which looks very, very tough. We see a number of soldiers pushing this uh, Palestinian down. There's another organization which serves a, a, a slightly different role. And that is the ACRI, Association for Civil Rights in Israel. And they work much more on the legalistic side, trying to deal with the legal issues which, which come up, uh, a treatment of the Palestinians, land issues, uh, and the whole question of military training, which is often within the Palestinian uh, reality. The, um, one of the most interesting phenomena that I found, and, and I looked into this in great detail, and in some senses we could have a whole uh, program just on the question of women in the Israeli army. Just let's backtrack for a bit. Right from the early days, right from the pre-state period, we had women in the various underground forces. They were in the Haganah, they were in the Palmach, they were in the Etzel, and they were in the Lehi. All those um, different militias included women as well. So early on, the Israeli army had a phenomenon which was not the norm of most armies of the world at that time, and that was we need women, women should be with us, not always in the early stages were they doing the exact same uh, jobs as the men, but they were certainly within the Israeli army. The, for many years, the parents were reluctant to allow the daughters to go into the IDF. And they favored national service, national service, if particularly if you're either from a religious family, or you feel that your 18 year old daughter to be on an army base where the women are gonna be vastly outnumbered uh, by the men, that that was gonna put that particular young woman in a very tough uh, personal situations. And so there was for many years a feeling that, you know, if you really care for your daughter, you don't allow her to go into the army, you try and find some alternative or if she does go into the army, you make sure she's in one of those positions where she comes home uh, every night. The situation has changed. As time goes by, based not on what the parents necessarily think, but on what the women themselves think. The Israeli women have uh, looked very clearly at what in fact happens to them in the big picture, not only between the ages of 18 and 21, but rather in the big picture of living in Israeli society. They realized that when they got into the workplace, 
they would often find themselves in a situation where the men had a different language. There's an army language. There's a, it's a, it's a slang. It's a slang within the uh, Hebrew environment, which if you haven't been in the army, you, it never becomes yours. You might know the words, but, but you don't uh, incorporate it into your essence. So um, women were realizing just in terms of long-term careers that they were going to be at a disadvantage. They firstly um, would uh, go to university at a younger age. So they would be in a classroom where the men were coming in, in many cases, uh, three, four, or five, sometimes even five years uh, older than them. And um, generally, there was a feeling that um, army roles are in dangerous. By the way, uh, not only in terms of dealing with the enemy, but for example, there have been major questions of carrying heavy army equipment, what it could uh, bring about, how it could influence in a negative way on the, on the women. Um, the, uh, the issue is that by and large, the army has, um, has favored shorter periods of serving. This in itself acts against women. There are certain army jobs which you have to, the tra early training period is extremely long, and therefore the two or two and a half years service of the women would be inadequate. And so therefore they were kept out of certain elite units. In addition to which, as I hinted before, sexual harassment, which comes up again and again, unfortunately, not only within the Israeli army, but in Israel uh, generally. Um, and uh, uh, the sexual harassment sort of enabled the rabbinic authorities to doubly force women, not only religious women, but their argument was that women generally should uh, not uh, be allowed in the army. And then the other issue, which is quite volatile in this country, is the rabbinic interference about the clothing that women are using. They want women to wear dresses and not, not uh, slacks. And they're again singing, uh, the women singing in uh, various collective environments. However, the pictures I, I brought here are really pictures of the, of the internal women's revolution going on in Israeli society. And I found it very exciting. By the way, um, I was convinced at an early stage that women have to be with us in all frameworks. And here we find a woman in this position. We find women here in, um, in pilot or navigator positions. And here we find women in a combat unit. My very final comment, and then we have time for questions. The, um, what, what would I, how would I sum up what I've been trying to present? Firstly, this is probably the best way to build a nation. Unfortunately, 50% of Israeli society aren't part of the nation building process. But we see here, for example, B'nai Manashe, people who come from India, come here, they're religious people we see here, and are brought into the Israeli army. And that's what they very much want. They speak very highly of the honor of serving in the, in, in the society. Young people mature. It's definitely the army assists us being a startup nation. That's true that significant number have negative memories, which I've indicated. Certainly a majority of Israelis present those who have not served. So we have a society which is uh, divided. And what's most important, in fact, uh, is, is that the Israelis trust the military more than any other national institution. Thank you very much. And we have about 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. Wow, Professor Lips, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, very comprehensive. Um, and we have some good questions, but I want to, um, I want to begin with, um, with um, a confidential issue, which is spycraft. Um, uh, is Israel is known for being uh, first class spies. So um, how does the, uh, how do those units uh, who can't talk about what they do fit into um, Israeli society? You know, there's an interesting comment which we sometimes hear that an Israeli secret 
is something which your friends haven't heard in the first five minutes of talking about it. So <laughs> what basically saying is that the so you you know very quickly, you don't actually have to tell someone what unit you're in. Just to give a, a, a quick example, I remember my students, when uh, a student would come up to me uh, when I was teaching at Tel Aviv University, and they would say, well, you know, I I'm, have to go off for army service. And then I'd say, oh, where are you going? So they say, well, somewhere not far from Tel Aviv, which means it's an intelligence, uh, intelligence base. So the truth is that you have these ways of not actually having to tell exactly what you do in one of these secret units, but everyone pretty well knows. So that, that's really, so it doesn't really remain secret. I mean, no one tells you the secret part of your service, but very quickly, just by listening to the language, do you know kind of what they've been doing? So, you know, people would often say, I'm in a, in a unit, but let's not talk about it, which says everything that you want to know about the person. So <laughs> that's, that's how we deal with your important uh, question, Charlie. Thank you. Sure. Um, we got, we got a several questions about um, how, is the, um, how is the IDF handling today um, issues of... Um, um, LGBTQA plus. Good. Of the armies in the world, we are on the good side, on the more humane side. For a long, long time before other armies even thought that, you know, you, you would allow people of different uh, uh, interests, uh, uh, sexual uh, um, interests, uh, to, to, uh, to be involved in the army. There's, in Israel, it's never been a problem. In fact, we've had court cases where uh, two men uh, who were living together for a long time, one of the, the one who was in the army died, and the court decided that his partner would receive his pension, the, the, the pension of the, of the army server. So in the Israeli army, it's, it's, you know, when, it, when I know Israelis see some of the discussions which are going on in America, Israeli don't, don't understand what it's about. It's someone's personal issue. So um, for Israel, this is not a discussion. I'm not saying that sort of in the field, someone doesn't say something, but from the, on the official level, there's uh, actually no problem uh, about it. So, um, uh... Irene Lancaster uh, wrote about, very surprised here about uh, religious women in the army, CRSY Cohen advocated that religious women, Dati women in the army from 1948 and his daughter, Eli Raz is high up. Um, and the other thing is many Druze in the army for decades. So um, tell us about um, the exceptions or trends um, that might factor into the question and in society overall, please. Good. So, so <laughs> generally speaking, because the army is a non-hierarchical body, the possibilities of changing norms are out there. It, it's, a, it, it's a changing environment. There's on, ongoing uh, kind of discussions. And uh, as I mentioned, there were certainly women in the army in the pre-state period. The, uh, what's changing, uh, some of you um, uh, might know that there's the, the, some of the women's protest groups have included in their demands of a change in Israeli society that women should be allowed to serve in the army, by the way, and, and the pressure is in terms of combat units. Just to give an idea of what we're actually talking about, there are women serving on the Egyptian border uh, that's quite recent. And for many years, there have been women in women only units serving on the Jordanian border. So the point is that, that basically Israeli society and increasingly one hears that senior officers in the Israeli army are saying openly, we want more women. The question is often, by the way, whether it should be a women-only unit or a mixed unit. And interestingly enough, the surveys have shown 
that men in mixed units say at the end or sometime during the army service when they ask, they say they prefer being in a mixed unit than in a male only unit. It's very interesting. And the reason is that there's a, they learn about different people. This is the close contact between men and women. Sometimes it hasn't happened. They've been at a male only school, for example. Um, and, and therefore this is, this is really what's happening. So we, we're a changing society, changing army in terms of the agenda issue. Um, Jeff Kaufman, uh, from who I think is in the Boston area, right, Jeff? Right. Um, yep. So, uh, he's one of my lawnsmen, um, and I'll do my best Jeff to pronounce my R's. I will do my no. best to pronounce my R's when I speak on behalf of all Bostonians. Thank you, Tom Barth, too. Um, so his question is, um, our TV programs, there's a lot of them about, um, the Israeli army and, um, spy craft like uh fauda or the spy yeah yeah do they help the image of the idf or do they hurt it you know i, I think for example fauda is a fabulous program but I, I don't think people think that fauda is the real army uh it might be some very small units so most of us know that fauda is a good program to watch it's very dramatic and sometimes rather painful but uh, uh, all in all, it's, it's a movie, it's a movie. And, and I think therefore, by and large, you know, if you're mainstream Israeli, particularly if you're living in an environment where many people around you have been in the army, then you're gonna pretty well understand that the movie component is a movie, which is interesting and somewhat important sometimes, but really very uh, different from, from the reality. By the way, you, just to give you an idea, we find the surveys have shown that uh, particularly males, uh, boys of about 15 years old, are already talking about which units they want to go in. So, you know, they, they're being open, they, they're opened up and they speak to their friends or their brothers or something else. And, and that's really how it works. So I, I've got a feeling that by and large, the people going into the army, while it's hard to imagine exactly what it's going to be be like they do realize it's somewhat different from the movies that one sees yeah um there was an earlier part of my life that i thought that i might make aliyah and join the army and um the impression i got is the israeli army could use someone like me as a cook in uh one of the battalions uh so it just didn't didn't work out but anyway um no, that's I'm not true, to, um, We have You've got uh, the wrong information there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could use me to clean up. Anyway, um, my question, I have my last, and we've got some, we got some great questions. I and mean, unfortunately, we can't get to them all, but I've put your personal email as, as well as your home address. So if anybody wants to talk to Professor Lips, Thank you. you know where to find this we, guy. Um, we've, got, but, we've got a spare room and we've got a garden as well and two cats. So I, by the way, CSP is planning a trip to Israel right now. So I wouldn't offer that, Professor Lips. Um, by the way, anybody who wants to sign up for his spare room, uh, please feel free. And I see that the, uh, the Kaisers are sort of laughing at my jokes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anyway. So one, I always love with your jokes, Sean. And now, you know and now they're upset that they had their camera on. What can I tell you? Anyway, one last question, okay? Um, which is not necessarily about the IDF, but I think in real time, in the last four minutes we have left, um, where does Israel, like the Israeli army, but in some ways Israel, how is Israel? approaching the conflict in the Ukraine um, and its relationship with yeah. Russia, who has become their neighbor the last couple of years. Sorry, with who? What, I didn't catch the end with, of it. With uh, Russia and Putin, who've become, um, in the so geopolitics that, that, of the Middle East, their neighbor. That, that guy, that guy in Europe, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a strange situation. Um, Firstly, because we have so many Russian speakers, we have people from Russia. By the way, not all Russian speakers are from Russia, they're from other countries as well. Look, there's, the Israeli army, uh, uh, there's no, not really how the Israeli army looks at it, because the Israeli army is under the political leadership. 
So, you know, the question is, is more so the army would follow the expectations like the American army and other armies of what the political leadership is. But, but the, the question brings up something which is actually very important. And that is there's a lot of um, ambivalence within Israeli society at the moment. Uh, and uh, one point of view says we cannot annoy Russia because our, our ability to control Syria, uh, a very problematic neighbor of ours, is because the Russians allow us to bomb Syria, to go into the area we want. And that's only because Russia, which is the patron of Syria, allows us. So that's the one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is the moral argument. And I come from the other side. And I would have wanted Israel as a country to be somewhat more proactive in terms of helping uh, Ukraine. Uh, there was a kind of a reluctance, by the way, the army played, the country, as a country played it as in, a, in an unusual way. The foreign minister, Lapid, sounded as if he was very pro-Ukraine, and then the prime minister sounded that he was kind of almost pro-Russia. They were kind of playing a, a game together. But I must tell you, in the social circle that I live in, all of us are, are deeply, deeply upset that the Jewish state, where not too long ago we saw what happened to us because no one cared for us, somehow or other that seems to be happening again. And therefore, I certainly, and maybe I don't in any way speak for, for all Israelis, but I do know that many of us feel that we should have been much more proactive. I know we sent uh, 100 kilos of medical equipment um, I do believe that we are sending other equipment as well because I know, know how things actually work here. But uh, I, I would like to have us been uh, certainly in the first vote of the UN, voting with straight with America, not abstaining secondly. In the second vote, we voted with the majority. But uh, this is where we are. It is a very difficult issue, by the way. Although I have my own perspective and I know what I would like to happen, I also know that we are living in the Middle East and therefore we always have to take into consideration how we remain safe in the Middle East. And this is really the kind of environment that we are living in. Um, so hopefully things will get better in, in Ukraine. By the way, my mind is very much in Ukraine. I've been asked to give a number of presentations on the Jewish community of Ukraine. My heart goes out to them. I've been there five times, have some good friends there. And that's a tough story. Yeah. Um, well, I can say uh, we are grateful today um, for the pr presentation that you gave. And, uh, you know, CSP has developed a beautiful uh, relationship with you. And um, let me just close with the thought that, you know, first of all, uh, Israel may live in the Middle East, but it seems to find itself in the middle of everywhere. Um, <laughs> and so... Uh, and you've been really helpful uh, with all your presentations and helping us to understand the complexity of Israel, its neighbors, and the world in which we live. Um, and I'd like us to just pause for one second, um, which is just for us to appreciate um, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, the thought of us having a discussion about a Jewish army. Um, well-regarded, well-respected um, from around the world um, would have been the, um, a talk that would have been uh, labeled fantasy. But um, today it's a reality. And with that reality, there are some um, tough choices that need to be made and some difficult political, diplomatic, and moral dilemmas that come with it. Um, but uh, it's, um, it's uh, any of our ancestors who didn't get to reach this moment, um, what a blessing that we are, uh, what a blessing we have to see it, and what a blessing we have to have a teacher like you, Professor Lips, to help thank us you. understand it better. So um, I want to thank you all for being here today, and we look forward to seeing you at future CSP events. And... Um, uh, um, 
be happy. It is the Hebrew month of Adar and may happiness come to us real soon and peace to the Ukraine and that part of the world and the entire world um, speedily in our days. Hope everybody has a great day. Take care. Amen. Thank you. And if you do want to contact me, please write. Thank you very much. Keep Annie well. has a comfortable couch, so you'll love it. <laughs> Take care. You. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks for being here.